Well, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome back to the 2020 Washington Conference on the Americas. I'm Eric Farnsworth, Council Vice President, and delighted once again to serve as your host. Our plenary session today promises to be yet another outstanding offering, and if I can say so, we're in for a real treat. As before, our 2020 Washington Conference on the Americas series is made possible by presenting sponsors Chevron, Merck, and General Motors. Our gold conference sponsors this year are Chiquita Brands, Freeport McMoran, Integra Capital, MetLife, Principal Financial Group, Repsol, and Sempra Energy. Our media partner remains the Financial Times. Thank you once again to each one of you for your support during these difficult times. To begin our program today, we have another short video from a former conference co-host, immediate past Assistant Secretary of State for the Western Hemisphere, Kimberly Breyer. As all of you know, Kim played an outsized role in formulating and implementing policy toward the region during the first two thirds of the Trump administration, and she remains active with the council now as a member. After the video concludes, I will then introduce Clay Neff of Chevron, who will introduce our keynote speaker, Larry Kudlow. Council President Susan Siegel will then moderate a conversation with Mr. Kudlow. Should you have questions during this portion of the event, please use the Q&A function to send a message to host and presenter. That's host and presenter. Finally, a reminder that this session is on the record. Ladies and gentlemen, Kimberly Breyer. It's my pleasure to welcome today the assembled delegates, ambassadors, government officials, private sector leaders, participants and sponsors gathered today for the kickoff of the 2020 Washington Conference of the Americas. I'm Kim Breyer, former Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs and co-host of last year's 49th annual conference. I'm happy to be with you virtually today to congratulate the council on this important milestone and as the council hosts yet another great exchange of ideas between our friends and partners in the Western Hemisphere. The Washington Conference of the Americas provides an important forum for interaction between public and private sector leaders, including many from across the region in a bipartisan effort to discuss the most pressing issues in the hemisphere. Through my time at the State Department, the Conference and the Council of the Americas were key partners in support of hemispheric values grounded in a belief in democracy, free markets, and the rule of law. Last year's event featured participation of key leaders across the hemisphere, including heads of state, foreign secretaries, economic and commercial leaders, key voices from the United States Congress, and of course, the private sector and thought leaders. The convening power of these events not only results in a useful exchange of ideas, but also advances regional diplomacy. Last year's conference was no different as it featured a keynote address from Vice President Mike Pence and a meeting he conducted on the margins with the Vice President of Colombia. This year, as we all confront the challenge of the global pandemic and the daunting social and economic consequences of it, the Council's role in bringing us together and reminding us of our deep ties, our common purpose and our shared values is all the more critical. We often say that we are all in this together in the Western Hemisphere, and at no time in memory does that ring more true. Again, welcome to the 2020 Washington Conference of the Americas. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Ladies and gentlemen, we have received a message from the White House that Larry Kudlow is just finishing up a meeting with the president. And so in response to that, he's going to be a couple minutes late. So we're going to delay the introduction of him until he is on our screen, and then we will continue the program. I guess if you have to have an excuse for being late, a meeting with the president of the United States is probably a pretty good one. We'll be with you in just a second.
And it looks like we have uh, Mr. Larry Kudlow has joined us. So we will continue the program uh, with our uh, high appreciation uh, for his presence this morning. It is my privilege to introduce Mr. Clay Neff, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Simply put, ladies and gentlemen, the Council of the Americas is a better organization because Clay Neff is on our board. He is a superb professional, a business leader of global consequence, and he gets things done. As of July 1st, Clay is the president of Chevron Middle East, Africa, South America Exploration and Production Company based in Houston. He is responsible for Chevron's oil and gas exploration and production activities in the region. Clay has worked his way up with Chevron since 1985, when he began out of Louisiana State University as a drilling engineer for the Gulf of Mexico business unit. He has deep expertise, no pun intended, in both Africa and Latin America, and his position immediately prior to his current one was president of Chevron Africa and Latin America Exploration and Production Company. It was in that capacity that we here at the council first got to know Clay, both for his business acumen and also his philanthropic and humanitarian activities. In addition to the council, for example, he also serves on the boards of the Houston Zoo and other local and international organizations. Most importantly, he is someone who, despite immense professional achievement, you still want to have a beer with after work. He's just that kind of guy. Clay, it's a real privilege to have you, my friend, our friend, uh, to introduce our keynote speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, Clay Neff. Thank you, uh, Eric. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Bring up your video and we can see you too. There you go. All righty. Okay, well, thank you for that that kind introduction, Eric. Uh, very much appreciated. and. Uh, it is a, a pleasure to welcome the Honorable Larry Kudlow to the Washington Conference on the Americas. Mr. Kudlow has served as the director of the U.S. National Economic Council since April 2018, leading the coordination of President Donald Trump's domestic and global economic policy agenda. In this role, Mr. Kudlow is working to help steer the United States toward economic recovery as every country continues to navigate the global impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Many of the companies here today are taking part in that economic recovery in the United States and throughout the Americas. And if I may take the liberty to speak on behalf of our member companies, we are all very fortunate to work with an administration that sees us as partners in this mission. Mr. Kudlow understands better than anyone that free market capitalism is the best path to prosperity. He has been a longtime champion of America's energy revolution. And under, his administ under this administration, the United States has become a net energy exporter, due in large part to the pro-growth policies pursued by our policymakers. Much of that energy is destined for the Americas. The United States prospers when our neighbors in the Americas prosper. And Mr. Kudlow has been a defender of trade policies that open markets and enable growth. He, under, he understands and recognizes the tremendous potential in our hemispheric cooperation. This has been most evident in the, in the administration's commitment to North American trade and success in securing overwhelming bipartisan support for the new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement in Congress. Having spent his early career in, at the Federal Reserve and subsequent years advising Wall Street investment firms, Mr. Kudlow entered public service in 1981 when he joined the Reagan administration as an associate director for economics and planning in the Office of Management and Budget. In this capacity, he shaped the economic policies that ultimately came to define Reaganomics. Mr. Kudlow has also had a prolific news media career, working as a nationally syndicated columnist and a senior editor of National Review Magazine. But he is perhaps best known for his show, The Kudlow Report on CNBC. And many of us have had the opportunity to watch him discuss and advise on economic matters from afar. And today we, we get the, to hear from him directly as he shares the administration's strategy to rebuild America's economic resilience. Mr. Kudlow, 
Thank you very much for your participate in our, participation in our session today. And the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Uh, well, okay, thank you for your overly kind remarks. Appreciate that very much. Um, I just wanted to begin, I hope this is appropriate, but uh, your group, I take it, was founded by David Rockefeller, uh, who passed away a couple years ago. And I just wanted to say in remembrance to Mr. Rockefeller, uh, he was a great uh, mentor and friend of mine uh, in the 80s and 90s. I got to know him for one reason or another. And I just thought generally, I wanted to say what a great man he was. Now, turning to the matters at hand, let me uh, sort of give you a quick overview and maybe we'll take uh, questions. Uh, first up is the economy is, is doing well. Um, despite issues and hot spots from, from the COVID, um, even some even some backsliding on reopening the economy. It turns out from all the data, the latest data, and we are looking for high frequency uh, numbers well into August now. But it turns out the restraint on the economy uh, and consumer spending and other things from the flare up of the COVID was very mild. At least that's what we see so far. And if anything now, we may be bouncing back. Uh, I won't bore you with every number, but unemployment claims and continuing claims uh, both uh, continue their decline in the report out this morning. So it looks like after a little flattening of the decline in claims, we're now back. So that's a very a good thing. And consumer spending, which undoubtedly suffered in uh, Texas, for example, or California or Florida, uh, that looks like it's beginning to come back. Um, I sure can't make any promises about the virus. It's a very difficult story. It's very devilish. Um, numbers are turning now a little bit in our favor. Uh, and the threat is not over, but um, you know, I sit on the vice president's task force and I get the numbers every night and we are in a flattening phase nationally. Uh, seven, seven day average new cases is now falling below the 14 day average. That's a good sign. And the fatalities are leveling off and they will begin to drop. That's another good sign. There are still hot spots out there and we are working hard. Um, Ambassador Deborah Burks and uh, the CDC um, are working on that, sending representatives down with FEMA to help assist and guide and advise these areas. And not that you need to hear this, but we uh, strictly adhere to the key points, which are masking and distancing and uh, testing where appropriate and uh, good hygiene, cleaning your hands and just overall good personal hygiene. So those are the steps and uh, we're using the same guidelines for the opening of schools we are very strong, Trump administration, very strong proponent of getting the schools open for a variety of reasons, educational reasons, social relations reasons, economic reasons. And um, all the studies show that the K through 12 kids are the least vulnerable. Uh, so I don't know why, I mean, we're, we would work very hard. And if we ever had a deal with Congress, uh, we have $105 billion put in there for school openings. Uh, related to COVID. Uh, so, you know, that story is okay. I mean, the, the other stuff in terms of the economy, so we saw the rebound beginning in May. I, I would probably venture that the this recession, it's really a pandemic contraction is what I call it. It's not a, a macro event so much as it is um, a natural disaster, which turned into an economic event because of the mitigation and the shutdowns. But a number of sectors are showing very strong recoveries in May, June, July, and in fact, early August. Um, there's a housing boom going on. Uh, there's a truckers boom going on. 
Business applications are up very strongly. About, I think, four-fifths or so, 80% of small businesses uh, have reopened. Uh, another good sign. Uh, things like manufacturing is absolutely booming. The ISM numbers are very strong. The automobile sector is leading the way. And I would add, without getting too far into the weeds, but uh, inventories have dropped substantially. We, we saw a decline of about 350 billion in inventories in the second quarter. So the inventories are very low, but the automobile demand is very strong and uh, business is gonna start uh, manufacturing more, construction more uh, to fill up the shelves to meet the demand. Retail sales is still very strong. Every one of them had a V-shaped recovery sign. We at the president's uh, presser last night here at the White House, we put a bunch of charts on uh, for him to make that case. Our stock market, of course, is very, very strong. That's a good sign. Um, uh, I don't know what I've left out. Apple Apple Mobility Index, Travel Index, uh, which had leveled off during the uh, flare up that began in late June, it leveled off and dropped a tad, is now rising again. Uh, so I think that's a very good thing. And in general, the job story is very good. We've had three blockbuster months of uh, nine million plus jobs in May, June, and July. And as I said earlier today, the Unemployment claims numbers continue to uh, uh, trend down, which is a, a very important thing. And the unemployment rate has come down. Um, it'll probably be in single digits, I, I suspect, in August, and will continue to decline through year end. Um, we're not out of the woods, don't get me wrong. I, I'm a natural optimist for those who may uh, know me down through the years, but um, no, there's a lot of hardship out there, for sure, a lot of heartbreak out there. And, uh, but I think it's improving. There's clearly a recovery going on. And with de demand rising and inventories bare, I, I think it's a self-sustaining recovery, frankly. Uh, these things always depend on the state of the virus, but we've come a long way on the virus in the past four or five months uh, with our experience, with our uh, PPE, uh, with our guidelines on masking and so forth. Um, we're actually developing um, quite a few now uh, therapies or medicines. I did a conference call yesterday, I think, or the day before yesterday with the pharma companies and a lot of biotech companies. So there's a lot of therapies coming on and the vaccine story is moving ahead, um, frankly, at breathtaking speed. Several companies, as many as a half a dozen companies are in phase three of their testing process. And um, uh, Tony Fauci and others have suggested uh, well before year end, we could, I say we could have a vaccine which will not only help the health story, but will also, I think, help the psychological story. Everything we do with schools and businesses and so forth has to be safe and secure following the guidelines. And we've stressed that uh, as much as we possibly can so people have gotten the message. So it's an improving story. I reckon just brought some numbers, we'll get 20% plus growth in the third and fourth quarters. And given good policies, we should have a very strong uh, 2021. And a number of private sector forecasters are coming around uh, to that view. So it's okay. I'll just add, um, uh, the president came out uh, Saturday night with a number of executive orders, which I think uh, are very important in, in, in bolstering the recovery. Uh, we are aware that there are still 16 million people unemployed, maybe some more depending on the scorekeeping. So we uh, extended uh, a compromise, but very generous federal unemployment package of uh, $300. Uh, any state that has already put in $100 is eligible uh, for that uh, $300. So the baseline in the states was $400. We're adding to that $300. So it's a $700 increase, as I say, very, very generous. I wouldn't want to have it all the time, but I think in these current circumstances, we had to continue our assistance. And so we compromised on that. Uh, concerned about the disincentive effect. 
Um, the states want to put another hundred bucks in. That's great. So it would be eight hundred dollars all in, and that uh, program will be, I think, retroactive to the first of August. And president also announced, as you may know, a payroll tax cut. Uh, it's actually a deferral of the workforce side, six uh, six point two percent, which is an eleven hundred dollar wage increase for uh, roughly one hundred and forty million uh, working Americans who had the opportunity and managed to stay on the job during this uh, pandemic. So we're helping them out with some new work incentives and probably those who are unemployed will see that uh, wage increase and uh, that may induce them or incentivize them to come back into the labor force. We also uh, guarding against any eviction uh, problems uh, for single and multifamily homes. And we kept in place our student loan deferral plan um, waiving interest in principal payments. We've offered a zero interest rate. It's actually a good deal for those who have cash to pay down as much of their loan as possible uh, at a zero interest rate. So uh, I, I think these are very positive things. Um, we have not succeeded in reaching any kind of negotiated agreement uh, with the other side. Um, I'll see how that goes. Right now it's at a standstill, as you may know. Uh, but again, uh, the key point that I would make is um, is the economy is rebounding. It looks like a V-shaped recovery. And the recent news now is even better than it was a month ago uh, as we start flattening out and uh, declining, hooking down the uh, case rate and then the hospitalization rate and then the fatality rate. Um, the other point I guess I'll make is um, I've been around Latin America and my prior careers on Wall Street and I've worked with a number of governments on reforms. Uh, I'm no big expert right now, but um, I met with the president, with many of the leaders in Latin America, who uh, prior to the pandemic came by the White House. We had bilateral meetings. And um, we did sign the USMCA trade deal with Canada and Mexico. I think that's an extremely important deal. Um, absolutely full credit goes to Trade Ambassador uh, Robert Lighthizer. Bob Lighthizer is a dear friend of mine. We both worked for Ronald Reagan a long time ago. And uh, it may be the best deal of its kind ever written. And um, we're looking forward to that, adding significantly to growth and jobs in all three countries. And um, more North American domestic content, more labor rights, particularly in Mexico, um, intellectual property protections, very important. Currency stability is very important. And um, we have continued to work with our Latin American neighbors um, on a number of projects. Uh, American uh, Creechy, if that's the right way to pronounce it, or Crease or whatever. Anyway, American growth in English. Um, essentially private sector investment projects, energy and um, plus. Um, the development finance company, is working in Latin America. Uh, our own, uh, we continue to monitor uh, for concerns about China. Um, our uh, investment review is known as CFIUS. We just try to help out um, our neighbors to the south uh, if and when they need it with respect to um, um, Chinese influences, which we are quite concerned about. I'm happy to narrow down and talk about any of these things in the q and I'll do the best I can uh, to see if I can help. But that's basically our story. And um, given the circumstances, it's not as good as I want, certainly not as good as the president wants, but it's getting better. It's getting better. And we will see with hope and optimism what the future holds. So let me stop there and take some questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Kudlow, for um, your very insightful remarks. And I also want to thank you for your comments about David Rockefeller. He was also a mentor of mine, and he was a great individual and an amazing leader. But also, one of the greatest things about him is he was also a great philanthropist. Um, so um, it was great to remember him. So thank you very much. Um, let me start with a question. You, you mentioned China. And we look around Latin America and we see the Chinese all over the place. They're investing, they're taking out ads in local newspapers. 
Um, they're giving um, equipment to cope with the COVID-19. They're doing many things to kind of gain influence uh, in the hemisphere. Could you dig down a little bit more? Because, I mean, at least we believe that this is dangerous. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, we agree. We, we hardly agree. Um, look, the best part of our story with China is um, we are still engaged in the in the China phase one trade deal, which is going well, by the way. Um, going going fine, um, according to Bob Lighthizer. Uh, so we'll see if they implement it. But that is that's the positive in the story. The trouble is there's a lot of negatives in this story. Uh, President Trump is exceedingly disappointed in China's behavior uh, during the pandemic, the opening of the pandemic, its lack of transparency and information and truth telling. Uh, we are still investigating all that, uh, but we believe frankly, if they had come clean earlier, it would have saved a lot of lives in the US, probably in South America, undoubtedly in Europe. So that's one issue. We uh, also have a, a big, big, big disagreement with China over their uh, removal of freedoms from Hong Kong uh, and breaking uh, a longstanding deal with Britain. We find this uh, to be uh, unpardonable and um, violation of the so-called uh, uh, one country, two systems deal. And we hold that against it. And we have, as you may know, issued some executive orders to that point and um, including sanctions uh, on a number of Chinese. So that will continue. We'll continue to monitor that. We're very unhappy with their human rights um, and their um, uh, despotic treatment of the Uyghurs, uh, which has become a worldwide issue. And we are really particularly unhappy with China's continuous efforts uh, to subvert American businesses, uh, to hack, to commit espionage, to eavesdrop, um, including something that uh, NSC advisor Robert O'Brien and I have worked on and um, to undermine financial markets. Uh, their information is inadequate. They have no transparency of public companies. Uh, they do not permit uh, audits that were um, mandated by prior law, a public uh, company accountability board and the SEC, who just issued an executive order on that. O'Brien and I issued a separate statement. Uh, we will be looking to that and there they'll get a year, but if they meet our standards, we may uh, uh, delist a lot of their companies from the US uh, exchanges, uh, their activities in the South China Sea. Um, so there's a whole list of problems with the China story. Um, regarding Latin America, you know, I would, I'm not here to, to dictate or so forth. I'm just suggesting um, in my role, I sit on the NSC and uh, interagency committees. You just better, I would suggest keeping your eyes open. Sure. Um, they don't deliver. Um, you know, they want to come in and invest. So they say and loan cheap money, which is not so cheap. Um, but they don't, they tend to use Chinese labor, not local labor. Um, they tend to damage the companies that they get involved and they try to buy them up cheap. Uh, so that whole infrastructure play has not panned out in different parts of the globe and including Latin America from what I gather. And that's why we are monitoring Chinese investment and will uh, presumably share our information with all of our friends in Latin America to keep an eye on China. They are a subverting force right now. And um, uh, this has to be watched very, very carefully. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Roberto Walker, who's the president for Latin America of the Principal Financial Group. Roberto, please unmute your phone and ask your question. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Susanna, Mr. 
You're, you're going in and out. You're going in and out, Roberto. Try again. If not, I have your question so I could ask it. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear him, Mr. Kudlow? No. No. Why don't you, can you translate, sir? I sure can. I can ask the question if you want. Yeah. Okay, Roberto. Uh, okay. more, more tech training, Roberto, and come back to us. Susan, help uh, me. Mr. Kudlow, as you know, Chile has a private pension system since the 1980s that has long been the gold standard around the world in terms of effective retirement investment. The system has developed a capital market of 250 billion that is the largest in Latin America. And if I can just add to the question, it has been part of what has helped create the Chilean miracle. Three American companies, Prudential, MetLife, and Principal, operate pension funds in the system with about 70% of the market share. The Chilean Congress is now actively considering legislation that would change the rules of the game for pension companies, forcibly restructure the industry by breaking up the companies and undermine the investments made by US companies. As an American investor, we'd appreciate if the administration could encourage at a high level with the government of Chile to protect the private pension system and the investor rights of these American firms. Mr. Kudlow. Well, I was actually a party to those pension reforms many decades ago. And actually we tried to put some of them in place uh, here in the States uh, at the federal level, but not succeeding. Look, I, um, Susan, I don't want to weigh in. I'm not familiar with the details. I don't want to weigh in on internal domestic uh, regulatory uh, matters. I, I don't think that's my place. I do favor the principle uh, first of all, of a retirement fund uh, for government and private folks. And I think that should be mar as market oriented as possible, uh, investing in stocks and uh, private company stocks and bonds and so forth. I think it's a good principle. I think markets uh, in the long run will outperform uh, government planning management. But I, you have to excuse me, I don't want to get involved in this uh, uh, local issue. Thank you. I, I think they're concerned that they, some rules of the game might change. And I think that's what's driving the question. Um, just I'll, for you. I'll have, look, I'll have a look into it, actually, because I've always had an interest in the Chilean miracle. It was a It is a miracle, actually. Um, and um, so the next question comes from Inigo Benachea, and I, maybe I'll just read it, it'll be easier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kudlow. Do you still think the economy needs a strong second stimulus bill? And are you concerned for a second wave of the virus in the fall? Well, I, I'm always concerned about the virus, always. It's interesting, second wave is right, because what's happened is these uh, hot spots that developed in the last uh, four, five, six weeks were really part of the first wave, which moved south and west. And so we you know, had to cope with that. As I said earlier, uh, it looks to me like we are mitigating and getting some success on that. Got my fingers crossed. But the recent numbers uh, are much better. Am I worried about a second wave? I'm always worried about that. In fact, I'm always worried about the impact of the virus. The virus holds the economy hostage. Absolutely. We do what we can, and we've come a long way. As I said, we've set up a complete infrastructure uh, from equipment through testing and vaccines and therapies. And it's a public-private cooperative with President Trump, of course, uh, has a strong belief in the creativity of the private sector. And, you know, our administration continuously works very carefully with private companies who have been spectacular in their cooperation. And we also work carefully with the governors. So yes, I'm always concerned. Um, 
right now the economy, as I said, is uh, definitely improving and the signs of the V-shaped recovery are proliferating. Um, do we need a second stimulus package, quote unquote? Well, to some extent, the president's executive orders uh, fill that need on the payroll tax and the unemployment uh, assistance. Now, there are other things that are very targeted that we would like uh, if they could be bipartisan deal. Um, one of them is uh, 105 billion for school openings. Another is um, additional assistance or extending assistance to the PPP, the payroll protection uh, program, which was extremely uh, successful in, in my view. Um, I think the president is, is willing to look at additional uh, direct uh, assistance or checks uh, to families. We're still looking at that uh, and some you know other matters. So I, 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 I frankly don't think a second uh, so-called second stimulus, we've had a lot of stimulus, we've actually had about five stimulus packages uh, totaling uh, around $3 trillion. Uh, remember also, uh, the Federal Reserve continues to operate a uh, tremendous uh, a program of, uh, they're increasing their balance sheet, the money supply is growing by 25% year on year. Uh, their numerous lending facilities are up and going and being used. Um, they came in, of course, with a number of market stabilizing operations. Uh, for mortgage bonds and corporate bonds and municipal bonds uh, to help not only help the markets, but to help states and cities get through this. I mean, the, the Fed in total, more or less, the balance sheet is expanded by about $3 trillion and their lending programs um, probably in the neighborhood of two and a half to $3 trillion. So there's huge, huge uh, liquidity coming in from the Fed and, and that's to the good. And of course, it's basically a zero interest rate. I'm all for it. Um, so I, I don't think the uh, a, a pending deal, a future deal or something is life or death. But as I said, uh, if we could reach agreement and um, make it sensible, moderate, well-targeted and well-crafted, uh, I'm sure Secretary Mnuchin um, would take a good hard look at it. So far, their conditions on the other side are not acceptable to us. Thank you. Another question from Ben Ari Bukai. Um, even before COVID, global business debt levels were at a high, shifting towards lower quality debt. Now with the pandemic, this is accelerating. How are you thinking about tailwinds from debt levels on the economic environment you describe? Well, look, I. Um, I don't follow the corporate debt numbers for every country. But what I'll say is in the US, which is a good representation of the rest of the world, um, the credit spreads, the credit risk spreads have been narrowing significantly. We had a terrific bump up when the virus first uh, came down in March and April, but uh, consistent with the improving stock market. I mean, from late March, I think the bottom in stocks is March 23rd, and the S&P 500 is up 50%. Um, the NASDAQ up even more, setting records, but the S&P and the Dow are close to records. Um, anyway, while stocks are improving, the credit risk spreads are narrowing. And that tells me it's a vote of confidence in the debt of uh, businesses. I think that's a very, very good sign. Um, again, I don't follow the, all the emerging markets the way I once did when I worked on Wall Street, but um, my impression is emerging markets uh, have improved significantly. These are, a lot of these are dollar based. Um, dollar's gone down about 10% due to market developments. And um, uh, with hope for better growth and a uh, greater restraint on COVID. I think the emerging markets are performing better. And as I, I think I mentioned, perhaps not, I, I, I do follow commodity markets, at least in dollar terms, and commodities have gone up significantly 
uh, in recent uh, weeks. In fact, there's a housing boom going on in the U.S., significant housing boom, which is going to last some time. And I noticed lumber prices are up something like 150% from the bottom. So in general, uh, I think credit markets and debt markets are in pretty good shape. Your question on emerging markets in Latin America, obviously what people are afraid of is a second lost decade because the growth, there are enormous declines in growth in many countries. And I think everybody's hopeful that just as you're predicting in this country, a deep V recovery, that in Latin America, they will also have a deep V recovery to try to recoup some of the, the ground that they've lost. Um, My only comment there uh, is, um, uh, as your moderator said at the beginning, uh, free market capitalism is the best path to prosperity. And um, I had a TV show for about 15 years, and you'd say that at the beginning of every show. So I'll just put that out there and feel free to agree or disagree, but that is my view. And I also think, and I this is just me, this is not the president uh, has said this publicly, but um, uh, I think the whole region should be dollarized. And we've already seen dollarization in, I guess, Ecuador, El Salvador, and Panama, um, maybe some others. Um, but I, I think the whole region should be dollarized. And that would take away a lot of problems. And stable currencies are essential to economic growth. And that's just me. Feel free to. Or well, I actually agree with you because the solution for many of these countries is private sector investment or public private partnerships in some cases, but this is critical um, for the continued growth of Latin America, which is also one of the reasons the pension system in Chile is so important because it's created the private capital uh, formation for the growth and the economic miracle that we both talked about. Um, I think we have to end this part of our program, but don't go anywhere, Mr. Kudlow, if I call you Larry. Um, don't go anywhere, um, as I want to thank you um, for joining us. Um, I want to thank everybody uh, for joining us today. Uh, this concludes the first part of our program. Um, and uh, I want to wish everyone the very best, invite you back to our many other uh, events around the Washington Conference and other things. And I want to wish you all health, safety, and prosperity. Thank you very much.